Today we're discussing Delaware law on executive compensation, focusing on how Delaware courts review shareholder challenges to what a CEO gets paid under Delaware corporate law. Now, when a shareholder files a lawsuit claiming that the CEO's pay is somehow a breach of fiduciary duty, there's two different ways this suit could go forward. One would be a claim against the CEO that essentially alleges self-dealing on the part of the CEO. The CEO's compensation contract with the company is after all what we call a related party transaction. And it's a transaction that inherently has a conflict of interest in it because the CEO as a fiduciary is supposed to do what's in the best interest of the company. But of course, the CEO also has a personal interest in making as much money as possible. These claims don't really go very far usually. And the reason for that is that they'll be reviewed under statutory provision, Delaware General Corporation Law, section 144. And under that section uh, where uh, there's a contract between a fiduciary such as a director or officer and the company, so long as the decision is made by a majority of the disinterested and independent directors, and those directors were fully informed of both all the material facts about the transaction and the CEO's conflict of interest, as long as those conditions are met, approval by a majority of the independent and disinterested directors effectively eliminates any possibility of meaningful judicial review. Under those conditions, if, those, if that approval has been made, the burden is on the plaintiff's shareholder to show that the transaction is so egregious as to amount to waste. And that's an extremely difficult claim for, the, uh, for a plaintiff to make. So usually the plaintiff is going to sue the board of directors and claim that their approval uh, of the CEO's contract was a breach of their duty of loyalty or their duty of care. Now, the care claim would arise in uh, uh, the form of claiming that the directors breached uh, their duty of care, which requires them to act in good faith and in the reasonable belief that what they're doing is in the company's best interests. But as we know, a care claim immediately bumps into the business judgment rule which substantially insulates director decisions from judicial review under the business judgment rule so long as the directors did not uh, act fraudulently, did not cause the company to act illegally, uh, did not uh, engage themselves in self-dealing. And critically for our purposes today, so long as the director's decision was an informed one, the business judgment rule will apply and essentially under it, the court will abstain from reviewing the merits of the board's decision. The burden will be on the plaintiff to show that the directors were uninformed uh, if the plaintiff wants to try and get past the business judgment rule. And in order to do that, the plaintiff has to show that the board of directors were grossly negligent in failing to inform themselves uh, of all material information reasonably available to them. It doesn't require them to make a perfect decision. Uh, as the Delaware Supreme Court explained in a famous case involving uh, Michael Ovitz's compensation at Disney, um, so long as they have a uh, information and decision-making process that leads them to have enough information on which to make a sound decision, the fact that there may have been some glitches, some what the court called a lack of tidiness uh, in the process uh, is not going to prevent the business judgment rule from applying. 
Because you see, the critical thing under the business judgment rule is not whether the board made the right decision. Uh, the critical thing under the business judgment rule is whether the board acted rationally, right? The Supreme Court in an earlier decision in uh, the Walt Disney litigation had explained that the question before the courts when they review compensation decisions is not whether the court would disagree with the decision the board made. That's an issue that's left to the shareholders. And if the shareholders don't like the board's decisions, uh, then they can vote them out of office. But it's not up to the courts to decide whether they should have paid Michael Ovitz 120 million instead of 140 million. In addition, uh, shareholder claims arising under uh, the duty of care are also going to bump into uh, Section 141E of the Delaware Code, which is a statutory provision that's separate from the business judgment rule. And it provides that director decisions will be fully protected if the directors rely in good faith on uh, information, opinions, reports that they receive from corporate officers, or, and this is the critical point for our purposes, or information, opinions, and reports that they receive from outside experts. As long as the board reasonably believes that this outside expert, uh, that the matter is within that outside expert's professional competence, and so long as the expert is chosen using reasonable care, uh, and so long as the board relies on that expert's opinion in good faith, uh, they will be fully protected. And this is where the use of compensation consultants has become a critical feature of executive compensation decisions. The well-counseled board will always bring in a professional compensation consultant to advise them on how much to pay the CEO, how to structure the CEO's pay in terms of salary, stock options, restricted stock, and so on. And as long as the board does that, and as long as the board engages in a sufficient inquiry into the, uh, the reasons behind the consultant's opinions, that takes care of two birds with one stone. Number one, it ensures that the board is sufficiently well-informed so that the business judgment rule kicks into play. And secondly, it invokes the Section 141E defense. So as you can imagine, successful care claims against directors um, in this context are extremely rare. The other argument that um, shareholders can make and have made sometimes successfully is to argue that uh, the director's decision was made in bad faith. And there is an obligation under Delaware law that is part of the duty of loyalty under Delaware law for directors to act in good faith. And in the Walt Disney case, um, uh, the directors explained that bad faith meant either a subjective intent to harm the corporation or a deliberate disregard of known fiduciary duties, conscientiously disregarding uh, your fiduciary obligations to the company. And a good example of that was in the case of, of Ryan versus Gifford. What happened in that case was that uh, the company had established a stock option plan to compensate senior executives. And as is required under federal tax law, uh, that compensation plan had been approved by the shareholders of the company. Now, what happened in, in Ryan was that the compensation plan and the disclosures that had been in the proxy statement uh, in which they explained to the shareholders how the plan would work 
said that the exercise price on the option would be the price on the stock at the close of business on the date the option was granted. So if I got an option tomorrow, the exercise price would be the stock market price for a share of stock uh, at the close of trading tomorrow. Unfortunately, in this case, uh, Maxim backdated their options. Now, what backdating means is, let's say the uh, option was actually granted on February 1st. When the stock price was at, let's say that's $30 a share. But in drafting the option grants, the company dates the options to an earlier period of time. Let's say that's January 2nd when the stock price was considerably lower. Uh, let's say that the stock on January 2nd was at 20. Now, as is typical, there'll be a vesting period, usually three years, uh, before the options become exercisable. But when they do become exercisable, the amount that the executive will get upon exercise is gonna be significantly higher than it would have been if the grant had been priced as of the true date it was granted. So let's say this is $33 a share. If the executive exercised the grant on that day, the first day of the exercise period, the difference would have been the correct difference, should have been the difference between the price on that day and the price on the grant date. 33 versus 30, or $3 per share subject to the option. But in fact, because the option was backdated to an earlier date at which the stock price was much lower, uh, the difference will be 33 minus 20, or $13 a share. Notice also that one X uh, problem with backdating is that it means that even if the stock price were to decline below uh, what should have been the exercise price, the effect of backdating is that the stock will still be in the money, the options will still be in the money, and you can make money by cashing them in, even though the stock has gone down uh, relative to when the options were actually granted which sort of defeats the whole purpose of having incentive compensation. And in Ryan, the Chancery Court explained, I think perfectly correctly, that that was uh, bad faith conduct, that an intentional violation of the shareholders approved plan um, is bad faith. Um, how the deliberate violation of the plan as it was approved by the shareholders and the fraudulent dating of an option could be anything other than bad faith it is really hard to, hard to explain. The third challenge that a shareholder might make to executive compensation would be to claim that it amounts to corporate waste. And what is waste? Well, waste is a transaction that is so one-sided that no one person of ordinary sound judgment could conclude that the corporation has received adequate consideration. And critically, when a um, shareholder alleges that the compensation the CEO got amounted to waste, the court is not going to review the merits of the decision. Absent irrationality on the part of the board, compensation is a matter of business judgment and the court will not review the decision. And it's critical to understand here that the references in the opinions to 
irrationality or lack of a rational business purpose does not contemplate substantive review of the merits of the board's decisions. Rational here means conceivable or imaginable. If there's any possibility that the decision was motivated by a legitimate business reason, then the directors have not acted irrationally and therefore they have not committed waste. And so waste claims are extremely difficult to prove. One Delaware chancellor amusingly uh, spoke to the probability of successfully bringing a waste claim by saying that a successful waste claim was kind of like the Loch Ness Monster. It's conceivable that it's out there but nobody's ever really seen it. Now, I think the best way to look at this is to do some problems. This first problem is adapted from an illustration in the principles of corporate governance that was promulgated by the American Law Institute. To celebrate the fact that the Serenity Corporation has been added to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the board of directors of Serenity Corporation adopted a market bonus plan under which Serenity's CEO and CFO will receive an annual cash bonus based solely on the extent to which the Dow Jones Industrial Average increases during the prior year. If the in index goes up by 10% over a calendar year, for example, the CEO and CFO uh, will get a bonus equal to 10% of their base salary. The plan was designed, proposed by Serenity's Compensation Committee, which is comprised solely of independent directors, which is a factor, a very important factor. Although the CEO was a member of the board, she recused herself from all board discussions of the bonus plan, which again is an important factor uh, that strikes in favor of, of the decision. But a shareholder is sued alleging that the board has breached its duty of care, acted in bad faith, and committed waste. And I think it ought to be pretty obvious that even if waste, et cetera, is uh, rare and difficult to prove, that there's a serious problem with this compensation package. The company's board of directors, the American Law Institute tells us, could not rationally believe that the plan would function as an effective incentive for the CEO and CFO to produce benefits for serenity. It's completely unlinked to serenity's stock performance, except to the extent that serenity's stock performance now contributes to the Dow Jones average. But you can easily imagine a scenario in which Serenity has an awful year, but the rest of the Dow Jones does quite well. And so again, you know, the lack of any connection between um, the Serenity's uh, performance and the way this compensation has been structured, I think would permit a successful shareholder claim here uh, for waste and probably um, uh, bad faith. Second, the CEO of Firefly Inc. recently asked the board of directors to amend his employment agreement to provide for an annual cost of living and raise, pursuant to which the CEO's base salary will increase annually by the percentage increase for the preceding year in the U.S. government's consumer price index. Firefly's compensation committee, which is comprised exclusively of the independent members of the board and was advised by independent tax counsel and an independent compensation consultant, carefully considered all information relevant to the request and recommended that the board of directors approve the request subject to a proviso that the CEO's non-performance-based compensation should remain under the $1 million limit imposed by Internal Revenue Code Section 162M. 
After due consideration, the board of directors agreed to that request and subject to the committee's proviso, the contract was duly amended. Shareholder sues. Well, look, first off, the board of directors is entitled, allowed, even encouraged to delegate compensation decisions to the compensation committee, particularly where the compensation committee is independent and has independent advisors. The facts are teed up in a way that, that I've eliminated any possibility that this was an uninformed decision. Um, and so you're going to get the protections of the business judgment rule here. There's no evidence of bad faith. There's no subjective intent to harm the corporation. And they have not consciously disregarded known fiduciary duties. And there's no real credible argument for waste here. Uh, the board, it seems to me, has acted perfectly rationally. Uh, and absent irrationality, compensation is a matter for the board's business judgment. But let's throw some variance at it. Should the board of directors have conducted its own inquiry uh, into the uh, underlying facts rather than relying on the report of the compensation committee. And again, going back to that famous Walt Disney case, the Delaware Supreme Court made clear that board members are entitled to rely upon reports from the compensation committee. Uh, and as long as they rely in good faith, uh, section 141E says that the board will be fully protected in relying in good faith upon the, re the reports uh, presented to the board uh, by, among other things, committees of the board of directors. Uh, and so, you know, there's no problem here uh, were the board simply to rely uh, on the comp committee. Now, would your analysis change if the proviso had not been included in the agreement? such that the CEO's non-performance-based compensation could eventually exceed the $1 million limit that's imposed by Internal Revenue Code Section 162M. And my answer here is no. Um, there is no fiduciary obligation under Delaware law for a corporation to attempt to minimize uh, its uh, taxes. Uh, the Freeman case, the Kamen case, the Seinfeld case, all say that board decisions about how much tax to pay, how much tax avoidance to engage in. Now, now notice I said avoidance and not evasion. Um, a board that causes the corporation to illegally evade taxes that it owes is not going to be protected by the business judgment rule but tax avoidance is not tax evasion. Uh, tax minimization is not tax evasion. And so in any case, Delaware law does not require any particular strategy by the board to minimize its taxes. So I don't think there'd be a problem here uh, with including the, or with, excuse me, with not including uh, the proviso. What effect would it have on your analysis, if any, if the CEO were a board member and she had participated in um, the discussions of the proposal and had voted against it? Well, it's not clean, it's not best practice, um, but Delaware law makes pretty clear that as long as the other directors are disinterested and independent, that the fact that the CEO is present and votes is not dispositive uh, and does not rec uh, uh, leave the contract uh, void or voidable. What effect would it have on your analysis if the board had in fact delegated the entirety of the decision, sole responsibility to the comp committee? Um, Again, I don't think that matters. The board 
is entitled under Delaware law to delegate not just advisory roles to committees, but decision-making roles to committees. Section 141 of the Delaware Code lists some exceptions to that rule, but those exceptions simply aren't pertinent here. Problem four, Federal Alliance Inc. is a publicly traded logistics company that's in deep financial trouble. Zoe Washburn is a nationally recognized turnaround expert who has successfully rescued three other logistics and transportation companies from the brink of bankruptcy and turned each into highly profitable enterprises. Federal Alliance brings Zoe in to turn the company around again, uh, to turn their company around. And her employment contract specifies that she was to receive immediately vesting options to buy 1 million shares with an uh, exercise price equal to the price as of the close of trading on the date the contract was executed. Although the contract had neither been um, uh, uh, executed until uh, late on the day uh, on June 20, um, Washburn insisted as a condition of her employment that the contract be dated uh, June 30th. Why would she do that? Well, she's anticipating that there'll be an, an immediate blip up in the stock price when this vaunted turnaround expert joins uh, the company, but that then it'll drop off again. Um, and so she wants to wait uh, to um, uh, see what the stock price is on June 30th, um, which is essentially the same as backdating. I mean, in this instance, it's kind of forward dating. But the goal here, again, is backdating, is the same as backdating. And I think the court would treat it the same as backdating. Um, the board is advised by independent legal accounts, so independent accountants, and an independent comp consultant all of them said that, you know, effectively backdating the contract is at best unethical and probably illegal. Believing Washburn's repeated statements that she would not take the job without the contract being dated in this way, and believing that she offers a unique solution of saving the company, um, a majority of the board uh, voted to approve the contract. One board member dissented, arguing that I agree the choice is between lying and going bankrupt, but I argue for financial bankruptcy rather than moral bankruptcy. And a shareholder is sued alleging that Zoe and the board have breached their duty of care, acted in bad faith, and um, uh, committed waste. And just like with Ryan versus Gifford, even though again, this is sort of forward dating, if we assume that the rationale here is a belief that the stock price on June 30 is gonna be lower than it is on June 2nd, then yeah, I think there's a pretty clear uh, violation of their obligations to act in good faith here. They're consciously causing the corporation to commit fraud, to break the law, um, by violating the terms of the compensation uh, arrangement uh, and so on. And, you know, the, the, the court in uh, DeSimone versus Barrow said, uh, directors of Delaware corporations have no authority, knowingly to cause the corporation to become a rogue, exposing the corporation to penalties. Um, Delaware corporate law, has long been clear on this rather obvious notion, namely that it is utterly inconsistent with one's duties of fidelity to the corporation to consciously cause the corporation to act unlawfully. The knowing use of illegal means to pursue profit for the corporation is direct or misconduct. And I, I have no doubt that that's what a court would say uh, about these facts. All right. Thank you very much. That concludes our discussion of Delaware Law of Executive Compensation.